So the stream has just begun. Hello everyone and welcome to another Dental Shadowers virtual shadowing session. Today we're joined by Dr. Park who is a general dentist. Dr. Park, thank you so much for joining us today and please feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Park and I'll be presenting on life as a general dentist. And if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat and let me know. Okay, so like I said, I'm a general dentist. I am currently doing my residency at NYU Langone. Uh, it's a advanced education in general dentistry. And along with that, I'm currently working with the uh, practice in California to provide teledentistry services. Uh, so any patients that have any questions or concerns before they come into the office, they can send me some pictures or send me a message about what their concern might be. And then I just get back to them. And if they're interested in coming in in person, then I help them to make the appointments. I graduated from NYU Dentistry. And for undergrad, I went to University of Pacific out in California. I was a pre-dental major in their three plus three program. So my journey to becoming a general dentist, I am a second generation dentist. My dad was also, or my dad is also a, a general dentist out in California. So ever since I was young, I was helping out in the office um, with all different kinds of things. When I was younger, I helped out with like media and advertisements and uh, just like reformatting their website. And as I kind of got interested in the field, I started to help out in the office and with shadowing and all those kind of things. Something that I really liked about dentistry was that it was kind of a mixture of science and art. I did really have a passion for science, but I did really kind of like that dentistry, it wasn't just like being in a lab and just like with data and numbers, but you do also kind of get like artistic part of it. And another part that I really liked was that you do get to form a relationship with your patients. I felt that with um, some of the other uh, things in medicine, like you might see a patient like one time because they have a problem and then you might never see them again. But with, that, with dentistry, you do get to see them like every six months or so and you kind of do get to form a relationship with them and you kind of get to know uh, their family, their friends, what's going on in their lives. And it's very nice to be able to follow them through that. Uh, just before we kind of get more into dental things, I just wanted to give some general advice for college. Number one would be finding mentors within your own college or major. I think it's great to have uh, like family or other people that you know that are already dental students or dentists who can give you some advice. But I think it's also very beneficial to have someone in your own school or major who kind of went through what you're already going through and they can provide you some guidance on like the timeline of things, maybe um, some recommendations even on like where is like a good testing site for your DATs that might be convenient close to your school and all these different kinds of things. Secondly, it's to make a study plan for your DATs. Um, I know that for me as a pre-dental student, that was something that was very daunting and stressful. I just didn't know what to quite expect. But again, finding mentors within your own college, that did help me personally, just because they kind of let me know that, oh, it's going to be a good idea for like our school schedule to plan out, like maybe sacrificing your winter break or summer break, just so that you get, get a good amount of time to study. So you're not stressed with that during school. That's what worked for me, but yeah, you, you just gotta find out what works for you. And lastly, it's to find a part-time job as a dental assistant or front desk at a dental office. Going into the dental profession, it is a huge commitment in terms of time and money and many other things. So you really want to make sure that it's something that you want to get into. And shadowing is great, but I think working in a dental office gets you a lot more involved in the experience. 
And not just that, but eventually when you do become a dentist, you do want to kind of have that knowledge of how or what the responsibilities of a dental assistant or someone working the front desk might be so that you can help to train them. So what is general dentistry? A general dentist is a primary oral health care provider who manages overall oral health care needs. This involves preventative, uh, doing fillings, crowns, bridges, and veneers, dentures, extractions, implants. Those are just some of the general categories of treatments that we offer as a dentist. But even more than that, you are also diagnosing oral diseases. You're promoting oral health and disease prevention. You are monitoring growth and development of the teeth and jaws. And you also need to remember that although it might just seem like you're just drilling a tiny hole on a tooth and putting a filling in, every single one of these are surgical procedures that you're performing on a patient, on their teeth, bone, and soft tissues in their mouth. So these are all things to really keep in mind. And also, even more than just the teeth and gums, you are a oral health care provider. So you are also taking a look at their muscles of the head, neck, and jaw, their tongue, salivary glands, and the nervous system of the head and neck. Something that I did realize and I didn't realize going into dental school was that talking to some of my friends who were in, in medical school, uh, they don't go so much into some of the intricacies of all the head and neck anatomy and things like that. So as a, as a dentist, you really are the expert of not just the teeth, but also for the whole head and neck. So when you're doing comprehensive exams or like a new patient exam, you do want to take a look at all of these. You want to make sure that you're taking a look at every single part of it making sure that there's no lumps, swellings, discolorations, ulcerations. Some of these might be normal, but some of these could also be something horrible like oral cancer. So you really want to make sure you're taking your time and looking at everything, covering all your bases. And when you need to, you can send patients for biopsies or any uh, other diagnostic tests. And sometimes it may be something that's out of your own scope of practice, but it's something that you do need to manage or you need to learn how to manage patients who are coming in with certain issues. And when you see a patient like that, where to send them to. So an orthodontist for braces, endodontist for anything related to root canals, periodontist for gum related things, oral surgery for surgery, oral pathology for some of these lumps, swellings, ulcerations, these kind of things that I was talking about before, um, oral radiology, so the analysis of any x-rays, not just the ones that we see generally with just the teeth, but we also have some x-rays that can go over the whole head and neck area and you wanna make sure that you're taking a look at that because sometimes you can see uh, all sorts of crazy stuff on there. And something that many patients don't realize or many people don't realize is that oral facial pain and is something that's also part of dentistry, um, pain that's related to like headaches, neck pain, jaw pain. Again, these are all related to dentistry. So you do need to learn how to manage them. And then there's some other things that aren't so related to dentistry. So in that case, we might want to refer them to medical or their primary care physician. So what is a typical day like in general dentistry? So again, I'm going through my residency right now. So my schedule is a little bit different than what you might find for general dentists who are out in practice or even some other residents, all the residencies are different. <clears throat> But for me, my normal hours are Monday to Thursday, working with patients 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. We generally meet at 8.30 just to go over the patients for the day, go over the schedule, maximizing on efficiency, making sure that we aren't uh, scheduling too much time for procedures that we don't need that much time for, things like that. 
And on Fridays, generally, I will uh, work with the other practice that I'm working with for like the teledentistry consult and things like that. My residency is in a public healthcare hospital setting. So it's a little bit bigger than your general dental office. We have on a given day about five dentists working, around eight assistants and four hygienists. I personally see around 10 patients per day, uh, just in terms of my procedures, but I will also have around 10 checkups for hygienists who are bringing in patients for their checkups and cleanings. So I will just take a look at their x-rays, their mouth, and all the things that I was talking to you, to you guys before and just go over all of that. So in a day, I generally see about 20 patients. What kinds of complaints do patients present with? So this is usually one of the first things that you talk about whenever a patient comes in. I always ask what brings you in today? And this can really be on a huge spectrum of different things, including my front tooth broke, I want to replace my missing teeth, my face is swollen, I want to whiten my teeth, I have headaches, or just the usual, I want my cleaning. And then from there, you can do some different kinds of examinations using some different diagnostic tests, instruments, and different technology. First of all is your subjective, val subjective evaluation. This is kind of like when you're playing detective to find out exactly what's going on. So let's say a patient is coming in with some pain. You want to find out where they're having the pain. So let's say their upper right side, when they're having the pain, that could be like when they're biting, when they're having something hot or cold, when they're just walking around, it could be when they're sleeping and it wakes them up at night. And how does it hurt? This is also something that's very important because this tells you, or this gives you a hint of where the pain could be coming from, whether that's related to their nerves on, in the tooth, whether it's some kind of gum issue. Yeah, so, this, so your subjective evaluation is really important in helping you find out your diagnosis. And then from there, you can kind of go into a little more details and take a look inside their mouth which would be the clinical examination. You definitely want to be using some kind of magnification or lighting. So many dentists you'll see, they are wearing something called loops, which are like the glasses with the microscopes built in. And some of these also have some lights on them. And some offices, they will have intraoral cameras and that just helps you take some very close up pictures of the tooth so that you can show the patient exactly what you're looking at. And then from there, you can take some, ra some radiographs or x-rays. The intraoral films, these are the individual x-rays of a few teeth. You may have taken those at your uh, dental visit. Those help us to see if there are any cavities, any gum disease. It, it will tell us a lot of different things just about the individual teeth themselves but we also have some different kind of x-rays like the panoramic x-ray, which goes around your whole head. And you may have taken it when you, need, when you needed to get like your wisdom teeth out. That will also help us to see a picture of like your jaw joint or your TMJ, um, the whole jaw, some of your sinuses. It will really give you a lot of information. And we also have some newer technologies for x-rays and that includes things like the CBCT or cone beam CT scan. And this is more of a three dimensional image as opposed to your traditional two dimensional x-rays. So it will give you a lot better of a picture of things. So going into some of the cases for today, our first case is of, oops, of this patient who is in his early 60s. His chief complaint was that he would like some new teeth. As he got older, he slowly lost his teeth one by one and he would now like some kind of replacement. He does have a history of type two diabetes and 
I'm not sure if this is something that you guys all know or not, but diabetes can definitely have a role in your oral health, in your gum health, and it can, it can really affect your whole body. But as dentists, we are looking at the connection between their medical complex issues and how it connects to their mouth. And yeah, that's something that we did tell the patient that, oh, this might be one of the reasons that you may have lost your teeth over time. And it's something that the patient had never heard about. So it's really important that you're talking about these kind of things. And our first step before we started any kind of treatment was to actually send them to his primary care physician or his doctor, just to make sure his diabetes was in check, make sure everything was under control. And because as dentists, we like to think that the teeth are the most important thing, but they really need to be healthy before you take a look at their teeth, because if they're like starting to like break down for their whole body, them like they might have some beautiful teeth, but they need to be able to walk around and to be healthy and things like that. So the treatment that we've talked about for him was some dentures on the top and bottom. These are some dentures that you see on the bottom here. These are just in wax. And um, when you're just looking at them, you just see something that is supposed to replace some teeth, something made in wax and some fake teeth in there, but there's actually a lot more that goes into this state that we have in this picture. So I'll go over, go over some of the steps in, in involved in creating the complete denture. So for this, it's something that, again, it depends on which office that you're at, uh, which doctor is doing the procedure. Some will have some different ways of doing things, some shorter, some longer. So there's lots of variations. But the first step generally is to take some kind of preliminary impressions. This involves using something called alginate. It comes in this powder form and you mix it up with some water in this kind of mixing bowl. And you load it up into this tray here. And you seat that into the patient's mouth and you have your alginate impression or your preliminary impression. Uh, this is something that you may have heard about. You may have gotten done yourself. It's not the best kind of experience just because you are having a lot of material and goop inside your mouth. Uh, it's just very important that you're managing the patient's expectations. Make sure they're prepared for what you're going to do. You don't want to just have them relaxing there and suddenly you're loading up their mouth with all the scoop. So once you have your impressions, you can pour some stone into them and then you'll actually have these, you'll end up with these stone models that we have here on the bottom here. With that, you can start to make these wax rims and that is what you use to help determine exactly how the patient is biting down because you don't want them to have their teeth too big or their mouth is gonna be wide open. You don't want it to have it too small either, or you might have their mouth have kind of like a, or their face dimension have like a crumpled look. So when you're making these, uh, these wax rims, you want to make sure that you're taking a look at all these different criteria, like how it lines up with their eyes. You wanna make sure that their teeth are lined up with their eyes. Uh, you also want to compare that with the, the nose plane here. You want to compare that with a, a line that you trace from going from the nose to the ear. You wanna make sure that, that their midline is right. So at this stage, there's lots of different things that you're looking at, and this helps to determine exactly how we're going to put in the teeth for the denture and how we're going to make the bite for the denture. So from there, you get something to register their bite with what I was showing you in this previous picture. You get the two and you kind of get them combined together. And then you mount it in this thing called the articulator. This is just to help simulate exactly how the patient is opening and closing so that you can kind of copy that when you're making your denture. And then you start to adjust this wax in the, in the wax rim here. And then you can start to set your teeth as you can see in this bottom picture. 
So, <clears throat> excuse me, with all that being done, that takes around four or five appointments. And we have this stage that you see up top where we try it in one more time when it's still on wax. This is the state that the patient can take a look, make sure that they're happy with their smile, with the color of their teeth, with how things are shaped, how they're aligned. And you're just also verifying that their bite and all these kind of things are good. And if everything is looking good, then you can send that back to the lab and they will make your final denture for you, which you see on the bottom. And so on the final appointment, you can try that in. And again, you wanna verify everything that we were talking about before, their bite, their midlines, making sure it's all lined up with their eyes, their nose, ear angle, all these kind of things. And if everything's looking good, then you can go ahead and deliver it to the patient. But usually what I like to do is when I'm gonna be giving the patient the final denture or crown, whatever it might be, I generally like to say that we're going to just be trying it in because many times it will go well and you can send the patient home with it, but that doesn't happen every single time. Sometimes you have to adjust something, you need to send something back to the lab or they might not be happy with the color of something. So by saying that you're gonna try it in, it kind of gives you a little bit more leeway and you don't have the patient be disappointed in you because you said that you're gonna be getting your denture today and suddenly they don't have it. So it's just a little thing that I like to do to help manage the patient's expectations. And if you do get to deliver it to them on that day, then you seem like a hero. So that's always good. So these are some of the before and after pictures. You can see that the smile is much more improved with some teeth in there. Again, some closer up pictures. You can appreciate that on the picture on the left before the dentures, you can kind of see how his lips are kind of curled in. It's because his lips and the, the dimension of his bite has been crumpled for so long so that things are starting to kind of come in. With the dentures in, you don't see that so much. You've got some support to the lip and that's helping to give some better profiles and contours for his face. And again, we'll be able to appreciate that here before the denture and after the denture, you can definitely see the improvement in the outline of the lip, the support that you have. And just in his general facial contour, it seems a lot more supported and not deficient. Okay, so our second case of the day, I apologize for the black and white photos. This is a female in her late 50s. Her chief complaint was just that she wanted a checkup and cleaning, so she didn't really have anything to complain about, but she did answer yes to one of our questionnaires or one of the questions on our health questionnaire this is just something that we go over with every patient just to go over their medical history and just to make sure that we're covering all of our bases. So she did answer yes to, do you have frequent headaches? So many people, even uh, students that are interested in going into dentistry, even dental students, when you ask them about headaches, they might be like, why do we need to learn about headaches? We're dentists. We are looking at their teeth. So many people might think that it doesn't really have much to do with each other. But actually there is a lot more that goes into your teeth and jaws that can be related to headaches. And that's why I wanted to present this case to you guys. So further investigation, it, uh, actually before I go into that, so when she answered yes to, do you have frequent headaches? This is kind of your shot that you can kind of jump in and start to play your detective game to figure out what exactly is going on. You might want to ask them some more questions. Some of the questions that we were talking about earlier, what, why, where, how, and this gives you a little bit better of a picture slowly and you can kind of ask more probing questions and then you can go from there. So with that being said, some further investigation revealed that she does have some occasional jaw muscle pain. 
when we were doing the extra oral exam, which is the exam of everything else not inside the mouth, uh, it did reveal pain on palpation or touching or pressing. Uh, the masseters, which are one of the jaw muscles related in chewing. I'll go over that in a little bit. And taking a look inside of her mouth, we did notice that she has some wear on her teeth from grinding. So you can see on some of her two front teeth and on her canines as well, you do have some wear facets or some uh, evidence of grinding. So these are some of the jaw muscles that I was talking about earlier. Um, you may have learned about some of these when you were taking your head and neck, or sorry, not head and neck, some of your anatomy classes in undergrad and when you're in dental school, you'll definitely learn a lot more about this. This is just grazing over the surface. But these are the four muscles of mastication, which mean the four muscles that are involved in moving your jaw so that you can bite and chew. So the pain that, that sh the, uh, our patient was having was in the masseter muscle, which is the first muscle on this list. And I'm not sure if you could see my mouse or not, but. It is this muscle right over here near the cheek. And that helps to, as the description says, it helps to close your jaw. So something that our patient reported earlier was that she does have some pain in her jaw area. And we did see that she has some evidence of grinding. So this has, or this kind of lights up some triggers in my head and makes me think of a number of different things. So that makes me want to look at some of her jaw muscles, making sure that I'm uh, feeling all of them and applying pressure differently to some of them so that I could see exactly where the pressure point is. I can kind of trace some of these muscles out to see if it's more towards where the muscle is starting or where it's inserting into. I can have the patient open and close in different ways to see if their bite is affected what, or if it's kind of limited in how much it's opening, if it's deviating to one side. So these all kind of give me some more evidence on what, or some more evidence on how I can make my diagnosis. And again, these are some of the many, many things that can be associated with joint pain. This joint right here is called your TMJ. It's a joint that you'll learn a lot more about if you eventually go into dentistry and it's a very complex joint. Um, you may have noticed among your family or your friends or maybe even yourself that you have like a little bit of like a clicking there. Some people have like a little bit of deviations. So yeah, all of these things are kind of related to not just your jaw and your teeth, but can also be related to head pain, eyes, mouth, throat, neck, ears. So everything is kind of interconnected together. So when a patient just comes in wanting a checkup and cleaning, it can end up being a lot more than that if you do kind of do your due diligence in investigating everything that you need to. So the treatment that we offered our patient was to make her a occlusal guard or a night guard. This is a appliance that she would wear at night. It's just a little piece of plastic that helps to separate the, the upper and lower jaw so that when she's grinding, grinding and clenching at night, it's not grinding so much into the teeth, so it will protect the teeth a good amount, but also a little bit of that space will help to unload the load that is on her muscles and joints, and that will help to hopefully relieve the pain that she has. And so I don't have the slide for making this, but it's very similar to what we were talking about before with making the alginin impressions, mixing up the powder and liquid, taking the impression inside the patient's mouth, and then you'll get some stone models. With the stone models, you can send that off to the dental lab and they will make you your night guard or occlusal guard. And then you get to try that in, make sure it's fitting all well. And if it is, you can send the patient home with it and just have them try it out for a few weeks, few months. It doesn't always go away right away. So you do want to follow up with the patient every so often. And if it's not going away, then you might want to think of some other alternatives. And once you've done all that, 
and you still don't have an exact solution, then at that point, you might want to look into sending them to a specialist, one of the ones that I was talking to you about before. For this patient, the most applicable one would be oral facial pain, which would be the pain related to your head and face. Uh, but fortunately for this patient, giving her the occlusal guard did help some of her symptoms, and we've just been at that stage since then. We haven't gone, gone to see the specialist or anything like that. So our third case is of this male in his mid-40s. His chief complaint was that he didn't like his smile. So taking a look just at his smile here, you definitely can see that there are some spaces in between the teeth. Uh, the alignment is not perfect. And yeah, so these are all some of the things that you, whenever you're looking at uh, someone's smile or even when you're watching TV or watching movies or just anytime you see pictures these days, it's something that you do want to kind of take a look at and think about like, oh, what exactly is not ideal or not perfect about the smile? And I know it might seem kind of weird in the beginning because you're just looking at everyone's teeth and being like, oh, that person's teeth are kind of crooked, but just keep them in your mind and it will, it's just like a toolbox that you can kind of train over time. And it's something that you need to really develop your eye for this so that you know what is ideal, what is not, and what you can do about it. So our first step was exactly what I was just talking about. Number one, reviewing your findings. So reviewing what exactly is off about his smile and then talking about what his treatment goals are. You want to make sure that with how they present, you wanna make sure that the goals that you set are something that are realistic. You don't want a patient to be coming in with like no teeth and then suddenly they want like a Hollywood smile and one day it's not gonna happen. Um, so you need to really just manage your patient, again, manage your patient expectations, review the goals that you set and it's something that you really want to set together because you might have all these thoughts in your head but if the patient's not going along for it, then it's just in your own head. So some of the findings that we had for this patient were that his, uh, I'm just gonna call them by their tooth numbers here. His number eight and nine, his two front teeth, they're canted or that means that they're a little bit tilted or off their midline. You can see for both, they're a little bit tilted towards one way. His midline for the top and bottom is not centered. He's got a diastema or a space between the teeth, between his two lower central teeth. And something that you may or may not have noticed is that he's got actually a missing teeth here and he's had his canine come all the way into that space. If you take a look at the other side, he's got this other lateral here or lateral or central incisor, lateral incisor and the canine, but he's missing that on the other side. So again, something that you need to point out to the patient so they, they know what's going on and so you can talk about exactly what you want to do with it. <clears throat> so for this patient, the treatment plan that we presented for him were some crowns or, or veneers on the top and the bottom for his front teeth to take care of his smile take care of some, some of the misalignments and just to get a much nicer and harmonious smile overall. Oops. Okay, so the first step in all this, again, it's going to be taking some alginate impressions and making a stone model. That gives you kind of a picture or something that kind of shows exactly what the patient looked like in the very beginning. And then from there, you can kind of add on to the teeth using some wax, which you see over here in this picture on the right in the gray. And this kind of tells you exactly how much space you have to build up the teeth, um, how much you need to take down the teeth and how you can change their bites. And it will also give the patient a good understanding of what they can expect once the treatment is finished. 
So again, on this picture on the complete right, you can see this isn't the patient that we just talked about. These pictures are from Google, but this kind of just gives you a picture of what the, the wax up would tell you. You can see that in some areas we need to take down a good amount, some areas we need to build up a little bit more. So you know when you're cutting down the tooth exactly where to cut and how much you want to cut down. So from there, you would take your handpiece and you would start to prepare the tooth or prepare the teeth. Um, you don't really want to say that you're going to be drilling down the teeth or any, any of those kind of words in, in front of the patient because again, it's all about managing their expectations. And there are a number of different burrs that you might want to use. These are the things that kind of fit into the handpiece. There are many different shapes, sizes, and different kind of grits for all different kind of locations. You might want to use a thinner one to get in between the teeth, some of these thicker ones to kind of make this margin here. You might want to use something like this. We call this a football because of the shape that helps to kind of reduce some of the bigger areas like the top portion or the back of it. So, this picture on the right is what you would kind of end up with once you have prepared the teeth to exactly how you want it, how you have planned in the previous step. So you will notice that some of these teeth, they're taken down a lot more because we wanted to do a full crown on it, meaning it's gonna cover the whole tooth. Some of the other ones like you see on this tooth here, again, I'm not sure if you can see my mouth, but for that, it would be something called a veneer. So it would just be the front surface of it. So these things all are, they're all determined by exactly how much of the tooth you have, what the shape of the tooth is like, how much you need to change the shape or the inclination or the color. So these are all things that you would plan in the previous step and then you would execute when you're doing this for the patient. You'll also notice here that you've got something black in the gums. That's something that I'll go over in the next slide. Yeah, so as you can see here, this is the, the kind of black thing that you were seeing before. This is what we call the retraction cord. It is just a little piece of string that will help to push the gums up a little bit so that when you're taking your impression for the next step, you have the whole little area exposed because you want the crown to fit perfectly around the tooth. You don't want one area to be covered by the gums or something. So it just helps to kind of push the gums down. And the second picture on the upper right, that is us taking the impression. Very similar to what we were talking about in the, the first case with the alginate impressions, but this time you're not gonna be mixing up some powder and liquid. This time it comes in like a little squeeze gun that you would put around the patient's mouth and you would have your assistant load up in the tray and you would sit that and this, Picture on the bottom left is what you would kind of end up with. It looks like for this picture, the, the cord or the retraction cord that I was talking about that pushes up the gums has actually come out with it. And after you do all of that, you don't want the patient to be going home with the, the teeth that you just shaved down. You want to give them something nice, at least temporarily to smile with. So you would make a temporary for them, which you see on this bottom right picture. And again, in managing your patient's expectations. You do want to prepare them that they are going to be in some temporaries for some time. The color, the shape, and these kind of things are not going to be perfect, but it is kind of like a test drive for how things will look in your final crowns. So you take the impression that you took, you send that off to the lab, and you will get something back like this. So the lab has used that impression that you took and made a stone model and they've made some veneers and crowns here. These are all made in a porcelain material. And then again, you try them in, in the patient's mouth, make sure that they are okay with the shape, the color, um, how their gums look, when they smile, whether their lips are going all the way past the teeth or covering the teeth. Again, these are all things that you wanna take a look at and talk about before and after your treatment. And if the patient's all fine with them, then you can go ahead and cement them in 
And then that is the final step. And hopefully the patient will have those beautiful teeth for quite some time. So again, here's the before and after. I think it was a pretty nice transition. The mid, on the final picture, you can see that the midline is not perfect, but I think that's more to do with how they're kind of biting in the picture because they're a little numb. You can see that this side, the teeth are kind of coming out a little bit more than the other side. So it does look like it's more how they're biting. So some advice to all of you guys. So dentistry is a lifelong learning journey. It's, they call it a dental practice for a reason. It's something that you will just practice for your whole life and hopefully get better and better. There are new technologies and techniques and new research that comes out every single day. So you might think that you're doing everything right one day, but then you look at the research and you might not have been right. So you wanna make sure that you're always staying updated, always honing your skills, taking any classes that you might find interesting. And there's really classes on all different kinds of things as a dentist. This can be from how to manage your office, how to maximize on your profits, how to do a filling better. Um, and even for like different technologies, how to do like digital smile simulations and scanning, many different things. Secondly, shadow at your local dental office. I know a lot of you guys are here right now because you can't exactly do that at this time, but yeah, as much as you can, try to take advantage of these kinds of opportunities. And when you do get the chance to go shadow in an actual office, that you're gonna have all this background information that you can talk to and ask your dentist about. And again, find part-time work as a dental assistant or front office. As much experience as you can get is always better. And there's just so much to learn. And thirdly is to volunteer at your local dental lab. So all these kind of things or all the cases that we went over before, they're not something that I'm doing all by myself. I do my own part. I send some impressions or some stone models and I try to make that part as perfect as possible, but that gets sent off to the dental lab who actually makes our crowns, our bridges, night guards, um, parts for the implants. These all get uh, manufactured at a different location. Some offices, they have them in-house, but most of the time somewhere outside. And in dental school, you do get some exposure to these procedures, but not all of them. And you don't always get to get all the background information about it. And it's sometimes a little difficult to kind of figure out what's going on when you're learning from a lecture or textbook versus when you're actually working or seeing someone working at a dental lab. And for many cases for these dental labs, since they're not working with patients, you might be able to find an opportunity even now, uh, even with everything going on with COVID. Um, and even right after I graduated dental school, before I was able to start working as a dentist, I did take some time to work at my dental lab because again, there's just so much to learn. Even after graduating dental school, there's like a whole other side that I was not really exposed to in the dental lab. And so much things made, made a lot more sense once I got to see them firsthand. So that's a very high recommendation for me. And thank you so much for joining. Um, if you have any questions, I think Kathleen will help us with getting some of those. Hi, yes, we do have some questions. Um, our first question would be, what would you, advise a student who wants to apply to NYU dental school? Okay, yeah, so I mean, um, with all the dental schools, I'm sure that whoever actually graduated from them will be kind of your best resource. Um, for NYU dental, something that I really found worked for me and some of, the, uh, some of my colleagues were was to really reach out to the leadership in the, the dental admissions office. Um, I'm not sure if she's still there, but for me, that was Dr. Mejia. Um, but every, sing, or like every couple of weeks, I would just send her an email just to reach out, telling her that I was really interested in the school, 
um, telling her some of the reasons that I really wanted to go to NYU be, uh, as opposed to some of the other schools and just really making sure that you're staying or making sure that they know that you're interested because as you may or may not know, NYU is a huge school. I think one of the biggest in the US. So they have lots of applicants. So you really need to do something to hopefully stand out in, in their eyes. Yes, I've heard that contacting admissions helps yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, is it good to mention that your parent is a dentist in your personal statement? Um, well, I think it's, if it's something that really did have an impact on why you wanted to go into dentistry, I think that's something that you uh, should mention. I definitely mentioned it. Uh, but I think that you don't want to make your whole personal statement about, about your dad or mom being a dentist. And that's why you want to be, be a dentist, because then it might come off as like, oh, why do you want to be a dentist then? So you might want to make like a mention of it, maybe in like your introduction or just just some point during the, the personal statement. But definitely you want to make sure that it's about you yourself and why you want to go into dentistry. Is there a continuing education requirement during AEGD? So for my program, there are actually a lot of these uh, educational courses built into it. Um, every month there's like a certain number of credits I need to fulfill and they kind of have like a curriculum for me. And so, yeah, it's very structured. It's, it's nice that I don't need to kind of look out for my own uh, schedule of continuing education courses. I just follow the schedule that they give me and it gives me like a pretty large spectrum of things in dentistry. But um, I know that like if you're just a general dentist, you take whatever courses you'd like and you can kind of do whatever you're interested in. I think that's great, but that might get you a little focused on like one thing rather than getting, getting the whole spectrum. So for me, I do like that part of my program that I do get a good spectrum of different things. What would you say to someone debating whether to go into dentistry because of the fear of the massive debt required to go into dental school? Yeah, so that is a very big, very big and important thing to think about. Um, I'm definitely a new graduate, so that's something that I'm dealing with right now myself. Uh, but that's something that you really need to think about and make sure that you really want to go into dentistry because you like dentistry. Uh, once you graduate and you might think that, oh, I'm finally a dentist, I get to just work like a nine to five job Monday to Friday and that's it. But you got to think that you're going to have like four or five, six hundred thousand dollars worth of loans in your, yeah, like in the back of your mind that you need to pay off somehow. Uh, but if you're just always thinking about that money side of it and all the debt you're in, then you're just going to make yourself miserable. So you really want to make sure that you're going into dentistry because it's something that you could see yourself doing day to day for the rest of your life and something that you're really passionate about, not just something that you're going into because you're going to make a good living afterwards. What was your favorite thing about the program at the University of Pacific? So I'd say my favorite thing was that uh, just the, the time period of it, I was lucky to graduate in three years because they kind of did make all the prerequisite courses available to me. Um, but with that being said, um, I was mentioning before when we, or before we started the presentation that I thought it was gonna be kind of like a program that once you get through it, it feeds right into the University of Pacific Dental School. Uh, which for many students, it was the case, but it's not like a direct link. You do have to still meet a lot of minimum or a lot of requirements. You have to go through an interview process and things like that. And yeah, many of my friends did make it on to go to University of, University of Pacific and they were able to graduate both undergrad and dental school, some in five years, some even, and some six years. Uh, for some people, it did take a little bit longer, but yeah, for me, my favorite part was just the time period, just because I was able to get out a little quicker. 
But I think that's something that can be done anywhere else if you kind of do plan everything out correctly. What extracurriculars were you active in or would you recommend for undergraduate students that dental schools typically like? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> something that I would definitely recommend is getting involved in research. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like anything dental related, but something in like kind of the science field does help. Um, at, U at University of Pacific, by being in part of the research, you don't just get like extracurricular points on your resume, but it also does help your GPA a little bit. So that kind of helped my overall GPA and also did give me some good lines on my resume. Uh, some other things that I was involved in during undergrad were that I was in like a pre-dental fraternity at my school. I'm not so sure if that really helped me get into dental school or not, but I can say that it did uh, help me make a lot of connections to um, a lot of the other pre-dental students at my school. And I still see so many of them to this day. And it's very cool that like, like it's been what, like five, six, uh, seven, whatever years now. And many of them, we were just all kind of playing around in school and now we're all dentists. So it's kind of cool to think about that. And um, something else that uh, through that fraternity, I did get some chances to volunteer and like, like give kids a smile or I'm not sure what the other states have, but in California, they had something called CDA Cares. It was like a volunteer event where all these dentists come and they kind of give away free dental work. Uh, I definitely wasn't assisting or doing any dental work at that time. I was just helping with the lines, but through that, I was able to meet some other dentists and was able to go shadow in their offices and things like that. So uh, yeah, any kind of connection that you make, I think is a good one. How do, hold on. How do people eat in temporaries? Yeah, so that's again, something that you want to manage your patient's expectations. I don't know how many times I've said that in this presentation, but it's something that's so, so, so important because let's say you don't say anything, you just send them home and, oh, hey, Mr. Smith, I'll see you in like two weeks and we'll deliver your crowns for you. If you don't say anything, then they are not really prepared for anything. And if something happens, then they blame it on you. They are like, oh, you shaved down my teeth and you gave me this piece of plastic for a temporary and now it broke, what do I do? So really what you want to tell them is that it's a temporary that is made out of plastic. It's something that is designed to be taken on and off and that they should really be avoiding any kind of hard foods when chewing in that area. And if something breaks or comes out that they need to come back so that we can put something back on. Uh, but yeah, it's really just about managing their expectations. You want them to be, to be prepared and they should know that they're not going to be going out and having a steak, but with some softer foods, it, it would be completely fine. So yeah, just, just preparing them. Would you refer to an orthodontist to align the patient's teeth first before doing veneers? Yeah, so that's actually a very good point. If... So let me just go back to some of my slides here. So like, yeah, for this patient that we did the, the case for, they would actually be a very, very good candidate for something like that. As you can see, there's some kind of uneven spaces in between the teeth. So something that you can do, the most ideal thing that you can do is really to send them to the orthodontist, get some like braces, Invisalign, whatever, to get the alignment perfect. And then from there, you the amount that you prepare each individual teeth would be pretty even because you've got the space evenly distributed. So you just need to kind of close those spaces. Uh, with, without that being done, you end up doing something like you see here where some teeth get a little, little bit more taken down than others. Some are completely taken down all around, some just front of it. 
So if we did go, go through with the braces before, we probably would have just been able to do the fronts of all the teeth. We wouldn't have had to do the whole thing. And that's really ideal because um, shaving down the tooth as less or least as possible, being conservative is really what's best for the tooth and best for the patient. Because if something breaks, then they still have more of their tooth to work with. So to answer your question, yes, ideally it's great to send your patients to, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be an orthodontist if it's something that you're trained with yourself. Many, many general dentists do do Invisalign or simple braces, but doing some kind of orthodontics before your prost prosthetic treatment is always most ideal. But, do, but does every patient go with it? Definitely not. So it's something that you do want to mention and talk about. And if they're interested in it, then great. And if not, then you do need to tell the patient, oh, because your spaces are a little uneven, this tooth I need to take down a little more, this tooth a little not, not so much. Sometimes after you talk about that, the patient's more willing to go ahead with the braces. So yeah, again, it's all just about talking to the patient and making sure they also understand what's going on and just helping them to make their most informed decision and not kind of putting down your own message onto them. How do you recommend improving our manual dexterity? That is a great question. So I think something that, um, that I didn't realize that would help me so much was uh, working in a lab or a research lab in, in school. We had to do like a lot of like pipetting and stuff. And that was done in like a fume hood. So I was kind of doing like a little bit of indirect vision, uh, meaning like you're like kind of like not seeing your hands like right away, but doing something a little disconnected. So that's a part that many people don't realize. They more, they're more thinking of like the actual manual dexterity of like working with little tiny things, which that's definitely very, very important as well. But when you're doing indirect vision or working in a mirror, that's something that also takes some time to, to develop too. Um, some of my classmates did have a little bit more experience with that, especially some girls, because they maybe do a little more stuff in the mirror than maybe some of my guide classmates. Um, that's just like a random uh, generalized statement, but something that I did notice. Um, in terms of just working with small things with your hands, um, you can maybe try working on like some random models, like, like making like a car model or like a ship model, stuff like that. Um, doing some like knitting is also great. Um, you can do some like fine painting. Yeah, just really anything that involves like fine work. I think cooking is also like a great way to just get your hands a little bit more active. Sounds good. Um, that's all the questions we have to, for today, but thank you, Dr. Park. We really appreciate you coming here. Thank you. I, I appreciate you for having me, and yeah, it was a great time. Awesome. And thank if you, you so have much any again. other questions, you can message me on Instagram or send me an email, whatever works for you guys. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Dr. Park, and thank you, everyone, okay. for joining us. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.